therapeutic approach to stress management through improvement of ergonomics in the workplace. So Heather, Heather Adele is a physical therapist and the director of rehabilitation and industrial therapy services for Wilson Medical Center. I think she was with the long hair. Her team provides a variety of rehabilitation services, including physical and occupational therapy, speech therapy, home health, and athletic training. So, um, Cam, where's the, where are they out of? Are they Pittsburgh also? No, Wilson Medical Center is right outside of Neodiche in Wilson County. Okay, great. And then Erica, sorry, you know, sorry Mary, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't know where Neodiche is. Erica Johnson uh, works for the Wilson Medical Center as well in Neodiche, answered my own question, where she manages the Wellness Center. Her role includes developing programming that increases the physical activity opportunities for people, promotes healthy eating, addresses tobacco prevention and treatment. And she's a certified health coach specializing in integrative approaches to self-care. Heather, I introduced you while you were fiddling with that. So I'm going to say thank you very much and please join me in welcoming Heather and Erica. Thank you guys for introducing us. I hope the audio issue is fixed. Yay. Okay. I'm going to actually give Heather the headset first since she's programming. Um, is it okay if I share my screen? Awesome. All right. I'm going to hand this over. Thank you guys. Okay. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? All right. Give me a thumbs up if if you're good. Okay, awesome. I'm Heather. Um, thanks for having me. I will tell you this is my very first Zoom presentation, so I'm just a little bit nervous, so I hope it all goes well. But um, like um, you said, I'm a physical therapist, and so one of the things that, um, that we do here at Wilson Medical is um, give advice on ergonomics. And so Today, I mean, ergonomics covers a huge area. I mean, we can address that in the industrial setting. We can address that with our, our coworkers, our healthcare workers, and we can also um, address that um, uh, in like an office or workspace. And so that's why I'm going to speak to today just um, because I felt like it might be more beneficial for my, this audience. So um I want you guys to think about uh, an athletic event, whether it be track, football, basketball, um, you know, volleyball, golf, anything. If you think about the preparation for an athletic event that can take anywhere from, you know, 10 or 20 seconds to two hours and think about all the work that goes into preparation of practicing, getting your form right. Um, doing everything you can to prevent injuries. I mean, all of that practice and preparation goes into performing at a level, at the highest level and, and avoiding injury. So when you think about our work settings, you know, most of us work eight to 12 hour shifts. And so what are we doing to prepare for those long shifts in order to um, prevent injury and work most efficiently. So that's where ergonomics comes in. Um, so here are a couple definitions of ergonomics. Ergonomics consider the match between the person, the equipment they use, the work processes and the work environment. And then I liked this definition which states that ergonomics is the blending of the workplace to the worker, not the worker to the workplace. So there are lots of strategies and, um, and, and equipment, um, accessories out there to help blend the workplace to us as individuals. Um, so what's an ergonomic injury? Basically, an er or an ergonomic injury happens over time. It's not, I guess like in the industrial settings, it can happen, you know, like um, a back injury or something suddenly, but mo in the office setting, it's usually an injury that happens over time. And it's when you're doing your, your muscles and tissues are working outside of their physiological limits and fatigue happens, micro trauma happens, and then you eventually get an injury. 
And so um, the most common tissues affected when we're talking about these types of injuries are nerves, tendons, and um, fascia, which um, just to give you a quick visual of what those things are like. So if you think of nerves, they're like spaghetti, um, cooked spaghetti, um, tendons, like if you're eating a chicken leg and you see the um, shiny, um, long pieces of fiber in the chicken leg, that's like a, a tendon. And then fascia is like the shiny membrane that surrounds a piece of raw steak or chicken. It kind of, it's like the container to the muscle, the container to the meat. So those are the type of issues or the type of, um, um, tissues that we injure when we do things incorrectly over a period of time. So, um, today, what I want to start with is just visiting about proper desk setup. And so we're gonna talk about the power zone. Another word for that is like neutral position. And I'll go into detail about everything you're seeing on uh, in the picture that's on your screen right now. But um, your muscles, when you're in that neutral position in your chair and at your desk, your muscles don't have to work as hard. And the, um, Staying in a neutral position prevents um, mechanical stress on soft tissue. And then also the more time you can work in your power zone, the less fatigue and stress there is on your body. So those are all benefits of um, keeping this posture that we're going to talk about. So I'm going to give you, I want you guys, I know I can't, I can't see all of you and you can't see me right at this moment, but I want you to sit up nice and tall in your chair. We're going to pretend like we're typing in front of us. And I want you to, you know, do the typing motion with your fingers while you're sitting nice and erect, your head is over your shoulders and then kind of take note of how that feels. Now I want you to stick your head out in front of you like you're protruding your chin forward and type, and you're going to feel silly doing it. But like when I do that, I can feel a tremendous amount of strain on the back of my neck. And so imagine keeping that position for an hour, several hours at a time and trying to do your work at your, um, at your workstation, you can see how that would cause a tremendous amount of strain on your neck, back and shoulders. So a lot of these things that we're going to talk about are common sense things, but I mean, I'm as guilty as anyone else. I find myself getting in bad habits of being in bad posture, especially when I'm like deep into some work at my desk. So these are, I hope, I hope that the visual on the screen will be a good reminder and you can kind of take some mental notes of this stuff as we're going through it. And then I'm also going to provide you with a checklist that we have to help determine whether your workstation is set up correctly or not. So um, do, you, do you just want to show them the uh, checklist really quick? And then, so this is something that you guys, um, I think will be able to have for reference and just um, going through your workstation and seeing if you're set up like you're supposed to be. So on this, um, checklist, you'll see VDT at the, at the top that stands for visual display terminal, which is basically a really fancy phrase for your desk, <laughs> your workstation, your, your computer screen. So if you see that VDT, that's what it's referring to. And I'll have Erica go back to the picture. And so you guys can kind of see what I'm talking about as we go through this checklist and I describe different things. So um, general working conditions for your um, workstation should include that your head and neck are upright. So you're gonna sit up straight. Your uh, head, we want to be level or even just bent slightly downward. Um, but like to look at the document in front of you or to glance down at your keyboard, but you don't want a, a flex posture. So you can see in this um, picture that this person is sitting pretty straight up and down. You want your head, neck and trunk to face forward. 
you want your trunk to be perpendicular to the floor. So you want to, like we said, want to be sitting straight up and down. You don't want to be leaning back or leaning forward. Your shoulders and upper arms should be perpendicular to the floor. So your shoulders should be nice and relaxed. Um, your upper arm should be close to your body. Um, relaxed shoulders help breathing. It helps decrease headaches and um, decreases face pain. So it's really easy. That's one of my biggest challenges is not to subconsciously shrug my shoulders up while I'm working. And so we need to make a conscious effort to make sure that your shoulders are nice and relaxed. Your upper arms and your elbows need to be close to your body. Um, and your elbows need to be bent at approximately 90 degrees. Your forearms, wrists, and hands need to be straight and parallel to the floor. So um, you can see how this person's elbows are bent at about 90 degrees and that their arms are, and wrists are straight out in front of them. When we go down to the legs here, your thighs are need to be parallel to the floor and your lower legs need to be perpendicular to the floor. Now in this particular picture, you the legs aren't straight down, um, but this angle that it's showing is okay. You just don't want them to be tucked up on, under your chair or extended way out in front of you. Um, they say that there needs to be about two to three inches in between your desk and your thighs. So um, you need to make sure that you have plenty of room there. And then you also want to make sure that you have lots of space under the desk for your legs. Again, I'm guilty. I have a big desk. There is a lot of room under my desk and I tend to cram things and boxes, <laughs> equipment. I have a sock aid under there right now, all kinds of things that I want to hide under my desk. And so I need to practice what I preach on, the, um, on that tip. So, um, but you want to make sure that your legs aren't crowded under your desk. Um, another, you know, we, we also want our feet to rest flat on the floor, um, and, or on a foot rest. So, um, your ankles are at also a 90 degree angle. So, we talk about 90 degrees a lot. A good rule to remember is that you want your hips, knees, and ankles to be at 90, 90, 90. 90 degree hip angle, 90 degree knee angle, 90 degree ankle angle. Um, one little tip is, I don't know if you guys wear dress shoes or, or wear heel, any shoes with heels to work, but um, those can obviously play factor into your ankle angle. So if you do wear heels of more than one to two inches, you want to make sure that you have a small foot rest so that the heel can rest on the floor and your toes can rest on the foot rest, which will keep your um, ankle at that 90 degree angle. Um, foot rest also prevents feet from dangling for shorter people who, or people who have chairs who might not be adjustable. And they um, keep um, perchers, people who like to sit at the front of their chair, um, back in the chair so that that chair can provide the support to your back. So those are all um, little tips there for, for your general body position. So one of the most important aspects of your workspace is your chair. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever had to buy a work chair, but man, they can be expensive, but this is really one area that you don't want to cheat yourself on. It's a very important to have a good chair if you spend any significant amount of time in it. Um, you want to make sure that your chair is adjustable and it can be adjustable in several different ways. The height of the chair, um, the depth, you know, you can move the back support forward or back to make the seat um, deeper or more narrow. Um, you, the armrests should be adjustable. And then some of the chairs even have, um, adjustable lumbar support, which is nice. The five it's, it's suggested to have a five caster base on your chair. It just provides a lot more, um, stability and support. And so that's something to consider as well. So obviously the backrest is important because we want to provide that, um, contact with your back so that you're getting that lumbar support that you need. 
Um, the seat width and depth need to accommodate um, you individually. Um, we in our office have some chairs that we share and it drives people crazy because everyone's always adjusting them to their different um, specifications. But, you know, we're all our own people. We all have different body shapes. And so really in, in order to, you know, get as much support out of those chairs as, as we can, we need to have them adjusted to our bodies. Um, so that's important. The front, this is a, this is super important. The front seat should have like what we call a waterfall edge. So it should, you know, have a gentle curve to the front of the seat so that your legs are, there's nothing like jabbing the back of your thighs or the back of your knees. We want to avoid those sharp angled chairs. Um, and that also is a good, you know, that's a good rule to go by. You don't, you can see in this picture how there's about two to three fingers with distance between the edge of the chair and the back of the leg. You want to make sure that there's no pressure in that, um, the back of the knee, there's lots of important nerves and vessels that, that run through the back of your knee. So you want to make sure that there's no constant pressure on that area. Um, so then the next thing we're going to talk about are the armrests. And so this is a fun fact. Did you know that one arm weighs approximately 12 to 18 pounds? So if you think about that weight just hanging off your shoulders unsupported, you can see how that would cause a lot of stress on your shoulders, the muscles in the back of your neck, your neck. So we want to make sure that your arms are supported while you're sitting in this position. And you can see in this picture that the armrests are raised high enough to support the arms in that 90 degree angle. Um, a good rule when measuring your armrests is to have about a finger, one to two finger width space between your forearm and the armrest. And um, that's uh, a good, good guide for placement on your armrests. Um, okay, so now we're going to talk about the keyboard and the mouse. So most people, I think, have those um, just right flat on their desk or their, the surface that they're working on. There are trays out there. If you do have a, a tray for your keyboard, you want to make sure that the mouse is inside the tray, too, so it's close to the keyboard. Um, you want to obviously, like I said, keep the mouse close to the keyboard so you're not having to reach. Um, any more than you have to. When you look at your keyboard, you can see that the G and H buttons are pretty much the middle of your keyboard. So you wanna make sure that that's lined up about with your belly button so that you have a nice um, balanced workspace. And then um, when we're talking about um, the mouse, you there are a bajillion different kinds of mouses. So you just want to, if you use it a lot for your work, you want to make sure that it, um, your hand relaxed fit, fits nicely over the mouse. And you're able to use it fluently without having to cause extra strain to your fingers or your wrists. And then you also just want to make sure that your wrists and hands do not rest on that sharp edge of your desk. And we'll talk later about some accessories that you can get to prevent that. Another thing to consider when we're talking about our arm and wrist position is not to wear a lot of jewelry when you sit and type at your desk. I mean, your watch, chunky bracelets, um, even fitness trackers like your Fitbit can, um, you know, cause your wrist posture to be off. So those are things to consider too, especially if you're having some wrist or hand issues. Okay, now we're gonna talk about the monitor. So when you look at the monitor height, your eyeballs should be in line with the first sentence you can read. So that is a good judge of an, a, a good way to judge the appropriate height of your monitor. 
So you might need to get something to set your monitor on, like, um, like it is shown in this picture. Um, I feel like this is one of the areas that's really overlooked. I mean, most people want a decent chair to sit in, but we don't necessarily think about eye strain, how much eye strain can cause musculoskeletal problems in our neck, back and shoulders. So, um, yeah, so we need to make sure that we, um, evaluate our monitor height and things like that. So the top line of your screen should be at or slightly below eye level. So you're able to read it without bending your head or bending your neck down. So people with bifocals or trifocals though, might have to lower that screen just a little bit to adjust for that. The monitor distance um, should allow you to read the screen without leaning your head or neck or trunk forward or backward. So a good rule is that your screen is 20 to 36 inches away from you. Like if you were to reach straight out towards your screen, it should be approximately an arm's length away from your body. Um, monitor position, we want to make sure that the monitor is directly in front of the employee so you don't have to twist your head or neck. So one of the desk setups, workstation setups that drive me crazy are the people who have um, a desk like in an L shape and they have their monitor set up in the corner. So they're facing the corner or where that 90 degree angle is. So that's not an ideal, um, that's not an ideal place for your monitor because you're doing a lot of turning and reaching behind you across. And so we like for that um, monitor to be set up directly in front of you so that your lay, your whole body is facing your, your work area there. Um, then it's important too to consider the lighting. Sometimes you have super bright lights. Sometimes there's lots of windows and that can cast a glare onto the screen. And that also causes you to have, um, you know, excessive strain in the eyes. And so, you know, it might be as easy as pulling a blind. It, if you have the, the option to move your desk or your workstation within an office, you might just need to rearrange um, your setup to keep that glare from happening. Or you can get something, you know, like a um, anti-glare cover for your screen, something like that. But that's also something to consider. Um, if if you have a um, problem with dry eyes, this is interesting. You know, lack of blinking is can be an issue. So when when you are fixated on something in front of you, you only blink fifty percent as much of of the time or compared to how you would normally blink. So if your eyes are dry, then you might consider lowering the monitor a little bit to correct that. So there's a helpful hint for you. Okay, the, the work area itself, um, we've kind of talked about how the thighs, it's important to have that clearance between your thighs and the desk. Um, you need, might need to con consider drawers that you're pulling out from underneath your desk. So make sure that you have plenty of clearance there so those aren't cramming into your legs. Um, and we talked about the excess space under the desk to make sure you have room for leg um, movement. So that's important too. Okay, so accessories. So um, you can see in this picture where there's a document holder that is in between the keyboard and the monitor. And so if there's, um, you have to read something and type, um, the ideal placement for that is in between the keyboard and the monitor. This allows for you to keep that power zone position, that neutral position where you're still looking forward and you can maintain um, that ideal position without having to turn your head re repeatedly. If you don't have that option for that document holder in that position, you want to make sure that you put that document holder to your strong eye side. So um, like for me, it would be to my right. And I want to make sure that it's as close to the screen as possible. So I don't have to do excessive neck movement to keep, you know, transitioning back and forth from the document to the screen. Um, 
the document holder also um, decreases eye fatigue because for that same reason where you're not having to refocus on two different things as often as if it's just right in front of you. So the wrist rest is a, I'm sure you guys have seen these or you might have them like a foam, um, long piece of, you know, foam or even memory foam material that you can place on the edge of your desk to rest your, your wrists on to help support them and keep them in that neutral position. Um, the one thing that I want to say about that is that you want to make sure that the heel of your hand is resting on that ret on that cushiony part rather than your actual wrist. If your wrist is on there for a prolonged amount of time, it can compress um, the nerves that run through your carpal tunnel and give you some carpal tunnel issues. So you want to make sure that the heel of your hand is bearing most of the weight down through that support. Um, little things like telephones, um, we need to keep those close to us if we use them a lot during the day at our desks. We don't want excessive reaching. Um, if you're on the phone a lot, I would definitely consider a headset like I have on today or, you know, AirPods or something where you can keep from tilting your neck to the side. And um, I mean, that's a bad habit, you know, too. I mean, you just don't think of those things until your neck starts hurting. So um, that's important to consider as well. And then finally, um, you want just to make sure that you are customizing your space for you. So we kind of talked about the telephone. If you are a receptionist and you're answering the phone all the time, you want to make sure that your phone is on your dominant side close to you where you can easily reach and pick it up. If you're an accountant, you want your calculator to be close to you on your dominant side so that you can access that without excessive reaching. Um, and then one of the um, guidelines that they have, like frequent work, like answering the phone, calculator, those type of things, you should not reach more than 16 inches away from um, the edge of your work surface. So that's something to keep in mind if, if you are using those things often. And then the last thing I want to talk to you about is called um, an ergo break. And so this is super important um, because we're in these um, positions for a prolonged amount of time. It's super important for you to change your position often. You can only do that so much in a chair. So um, I'm going to have Erica share my last page here. So basically an ergo break means that you get up for one to two minutes every hour to do something beside your work. And so I actually went to a course and a three day course to learn a lot of this stuff. And he set a timer, our speaker set a timer, just a kitchen timer for every hour. And so every hour when the bell went off, we stood up for two minutes and you could stretch, you could march in place, you could do some, you know, back bends, you could, you know, stretch your neck, whatever. And um, I'll tell you what, that was the first three day class that I'd ever gone to where I didn't feel like I was dying because I was so just bored, you know, bored and um, sore muscles from sitting so long. And I was like, wow, this really works. And so I, this is something that I really push in the um, industries that we've worked in and, you know, it doesn't take a long, it, it doesn't take a, a lot of effort. It doesn't, it's not a big deal. You literally just stand up out of your chair and do some of these things. So I have provided you with um, a handout with some examples of some stretches that you can do either, you know, even if it's, if you can't stand up, at least there's things you can do in your chair and you can either do them standing by your chair or whatever, but I'm a big believer in ergo breaks. And I think that if you, if you sit in your chair all day long, I guarantee you that you're going to um, ben benefit from this. So anyway, that's kind of my spiel. I know it's a lot of information and a little amount of time, but I hope it's helpful. And I hope you can take at least a couple of things away from this and apply it to your workspace. And, and, um, you can just 
you can all let me know if you have any questions or anything. Oh, do you need this? Just in case some of you didn't notice, I put the link for the handouts in the chat. And that's a folder that has all the handouts for both um, tracks today. So you, once you've got the link, you've got all the handouts. All right. Heather's segue was absolutely perfect for this next uh, little session on deep breathing and stress management. Um, she was talking a lot about the physical stress that we may feel when we're sitting too long. Um, so this is going to go hand in hand with how to um, respond to stress and to get it out of our bodies. Um, and when Kim asked me to do this, I couldn't help but think of um, one of the opportunities that the hospital just took on. We, we knew that COVID would play a role um, in our well-being and our so many facets of health. And so what we did, um, our hospital created a curriculum and this is what you're seeing on your screen right now. Um, it's a curriculum that will help you be, um, as healthy as possible, prevent illness, prevent disease, prevent virus, um, but also just maximize your own personal well being. And so what you're going to see on the screen here is really simple stuff. But these are the things that we believe, we truly believe, impact your own self-care. Um, you'll see this circle. Now, we're not covering all these today, but this is what I'm actually working on. A majority of my time is dedicated to these uh, facets of circle, uh, the, all these pillars inside the this circle. Um, I'm going to focus today on deep breathing and stress mastery, and I'm going to just lead you through a series of questions to just ask yourself. And I would invite you to mentally kind of take notes, um, either, you know, just, just thinking about them, or I've provided you guys with a checklist. So feel free to use that. And I just want to make sure that you're really comfortable and we're going to use all of Heather's really good tips that she gave us for alignment and nice posture. Cause that that's going to play a huge role in this, um, in this season of life and for the rest of our lives. So I'm going to scroll through here just a little bit. We all know that um, stress can wreak havoc on our bodies. Sometimes when we sit too long, sometimes when we um, have a repeated motion that's constant, um, when we have um, anytime our work or overbearing exposure to something that's creating stress in our bodies, but it's how we respond to it. Um, that can create this fight or flight. I'm sure you've all heard of this. Um, so I want to just add that, you know, stress in itself is, is really making up a lot of the chronic diseases that we're seeing today. Things like heart disease, diabetes, chronic illness, neck, back pain, all of this stuff is um, impacted by how you respond to stress. So I'm going to posture check you here and I will ask you to align yourself nice and tall and start to just take this moment to listen to the cues that I'm giving you. And I just want you to be present in the moment. And hopefully by the end here in just a few minutes, you will feel refreshed and kind of rejuvenated and feel like you have a plan moving forward for when stress tries to take over. We all know that stress is going to be here no matter what, but it's how you respond to it that that makes your well-being maximized. So you guys will see this little checklist here and um, signs of stress. We're all going to have different ways that we notice stress is residing, maybe mentally or physically. So for me, and I think Heather mentioned this too, it's totally in my shoulders. It is up in the traps. It is in my neck and stiffness and even my jaw will clench. So when you start to notice whatever item here applies to you, that's your sign um, that stress is starting to take over your physical well-being and mental well-being. So things like headaches, the grinding of the teeth. I don't know if any of you are experiencing that stomach tightness, even irritability. So when that happens, we have that shift of either fight or flight, which we talked just briefly about. And this is how you respond to stress. I hate to say it. I'm sitting here as a health coach, cannot get away from when I start to feel stress, I'm out of here. I'm the fight. I'm the flight gal. I start to get tense and anxious and stressed or worried, but 
I'm going to show you things, how to calm yourself and to relax yourself um, when those stressful moments arise. So it's important here too to ask yourself the question if you have a support system, um, a group, it sounds like you guys have a wonderful group here, um, supportive friends and family that you can actually share some of this stuff with. Because believe it or not, when you actually verbalize that stress or that tension or that anxiousness or fear, um, that is an actual wonderful coping mechanism that allows the stress to kind of release. Um, also in relation to that, um, and some of these questions are just, I mean, it's totally me. I feel like, do you expect to get too much done in a little time? Um, yes, I feel like probably all of us kind of feel like that. And so that's a, that can really wreak havoc on your productivity at work, your family life at home, your friends. Do you often feel, do you feel overwhelmed by your commitments or the deadlines or the unrealistic expectations that we all put on ourselves? It's a question to ask yourself. Do you learn more about time and do you need to learn more about time management, priorities, setting your boundaries? I think that's a good question for many of us to ask right now. Those boundaries are so important. Okay, here's my little spiel on exercise. I won't spend a lot of time here, but this literally saves me from becoming a crazy person. So exercising, moving the body, it does not have to be in a gym, even though I'm right here and I preach the gym life sometimes, it really doesn't need to be the gym. It really just needs to be about moving your body. That stress relief in itself is extremely beneficial for your overall well-being. I don't think people, they probably do say it often. And I think it's because it's tried and true. Um, here's a little bit about our nutrition and how that plays a role in your stress management. So things like caffeine and sugar, if you can just note how much you're taking of these things, and then a couple hours, a couple days, even looking back at what you eat and you might feel stressed, you can look back to your nutrition and almost pinpoint some of the things that could have negatively influenced your, your, your health. We kind of talked about um, the support system and your people that you can get to know who to go to for professional help. So a lot of times your health coaches and your counselors and your therapists, all of that's becoming much easier to talk about and openly talk about, if that makes sense. And that's very refreshing for anyone in the mental health industry to kind of bring forth that and bring awareness to it. Is there something that you are continuously worried about or stressed about? This could be like finances. This could be someone passing away. This could be maybe like COVID or your own health, this could be something that really has impacted your mental health. Stress starts to take over that body and negatively, negatively affect you. And really importantly, do you have a strategy? Do you, do you know what to do to improve the health condition or your coping skills? I'll give you one of those today. So some of those ways to combat stress Tried and true, you've heard them, but they're actually really hard to implement, I feel like. The deep breathing, number one, tried and true, so hard to do because nobody's gonna tell you to change your breath. No one is going to tell you, hey, you need to slow down, you need to take an inhale and exhale, even though I do that as a mom with my kids, but it's like a little birdie in the back of your mind that cues you, hey, I should probably change my breath, make it more intentful, mindful, and slow things down a little bit automatically reduces your heart rate. And that's one, one really wonderful way to combat stress. Positive self-talk, over 80% of the thoughts that run through your day are negative and repetitive. And repeating those negative things day in and day out is one of the worst ways that we can neglect our mental health. Um, some of those other ones are really great here. Self-massage. I'll kind of give you a little handout on that stuff too. Things that we shouldn't do to uh, reduce stress are things like watching TV, too much TV. I mean, putting on a show every now and then to veg out. Yes, of course. But if you habitually just go to the TV and zone out for like three or four hours and haven't moved or anything, that's, that's not going to help you too much. 
but those things that we listed above really are overeating. Hello, very guilty. I always go to the fridge when I'm stressed instead of going for a walk or just moving or venting. I think we are all probably guilty of that. Some of these other questions to ask yourself, um, do you have a hobby? Do you have something that you're putting a little bit of time in every single day that you actually enjoy? And I don't know about you guys, but if I don't put it into my calendar, I don't do it, but I always slide in a moment or two, a minute or two, a 30 minute thing, something that I enjoy. It's as simple as maybe grabbing coffee down the street, or it's going for a walk, or it's talking to my kids or going for a drive. Just do something that you like every single day, because nobody's going to do it for you. Nobody's going to tell you to take care of yourself. You have to, you have to take it on. It's your responsibility. There's some other major stressors in your life. I didn't tell you guys this at the beginning, but that circle um, is being used right now and piloted in Wilson County schools. And we're talking to kids about simple health habits and how to maximize their well being early, early on, so that they become great humans and people. And I noticed when I went over this section, these kids have a lot of big major life stressors, things like parents maybe being in prison, um, the passing of a loved one, early divorces from their parents, things that are creating extreme stress at a young age. And so I really think, and I don't know why this popped in, but starting this stress management type of conversation early on, I think will actually um, over time, you know, really, really enhance their well being. I hope so, anyways. That's our goal. All right, stressful work environment. So Heather talked really great about how you can maximize uh, just your physical environment to relax the body, to align your body. So this would be your cue to sit up straight, your posture check, your deep breath. Um, my health coach that I talked to, he literally says, we're breaking, you need to stand up, you need to realign your spine and let's take a little sip of water. And it's just normal for him. And I've been trying to do that. It's very hard to instill. It has to become a habit. So I would suggest if you have the time and you want to work on stress management to go back through that list and decide where you hit yes, where you need to work on those no's, but um, have kind of a game plan in mind. And that's part of my role and my job that I try to help people by supporting them with resources and things that they need to do. It's not me telling you what, what you should do. It's not me pinpointing and say, you need to go exercise or you need to eat healthy. And this, these things will help you with your stress management. It's you taking me, inspiring you to take your own, um, your own responsibility, your own accountability for your health. So I'm a big preacher on intentions, on goal setting, on affirmations. They're all a little different. So there's some examples on here. In fact, the one intention up here, my intention is to feel calm. And I even wrote that in my planner above every week. I decide what my intention is for the week. I want to feel calm, but I also want to be productive. Does that make sense? Like I kind of sometimes in that balance where I kind of like to feel energized. I like a little bit of uh, spontaneity and, and that type of feeling where you want to get things off your list, but I also want to be smart and I want to be conscious and I want to be calm. Your goal is dependent on what you want to come out of it. Do you want to learn? Do you want to redesign your life? Do you want to discover something that's on you, but your affirmation is actually you thinking that you're already there. I am calm. I am connected. I am, um, light and full of energy. I am productive. It's you telling yourself mentally that you're already there. What you think is what you are. And I always come back to that. It's pretty powerful. It all starts with your mental, mental well-being. So to kind of wrap up, I have a, cool, a lot of different techniques on this page, but I'm going to tell you a couple, couple of these that I utilize myself. What I, what works for me might not work for you. So it's important to take time to look over this and maybe circle a couple. The deep breathing is probably number one, in my opinion, for me, it's something that you think that your breath, um, 
that you do every day is fine, but it's really not the same as deep breathing. It's actually quite different. It's more mindful. It's slower. Um, I also, like Heather was saying, take those stretch breaks for you every single 50 minutes or an hour, put your timer on. You deserve that time. You deserve to feel good. And that's the type of stuff she didn't get fatigued in those meetings because she had a break for herself every hour. So that's, that's a really good way to, um, you know, stay whole, stay strong on, on your self-care. Um, another one of these that I like, I already told you that I write down in my planner, um, one thing every day that brings me joy. And it might sound silly to put that in your calendar, but for some reason I'm like really into writing and scratching things off. So, um, having that support system, having that person that you can talk to when you feel like you need to vent anytime that you can step outside and you can breathe fresh air, you're winning. If you can get outside and connect with nature a couple of times a day and just notice your surroundings, of course, notice the temperature and all of that, but just being quiet with yourself, being outside, it's absolutely one of those things that can really positively impact your mental and physical health. There's some other ones on here. Um, I liked the one taking time to meditate. If you all don't have the app downloaded on your phone already, I highly suggest the app called Calm or the app called Headspace. These are ones that are guided meditations. You don't have to do anything besides listen. And if you're a beginner, the guided meditations are absolutely wonderful. Um, and actually I'm taking a class this weekend on how to facilitate um, better mindfulness practices and meditation, because I still use guided, guided meditations every day. Um, one of my favorites is the taking a long bath at night. I love the word that they used here um, to dissolve your tension. And that sounds so refreshing to me. It softens you. It relaxes the body and the mind. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but that's one thing. I don't do it enough. I wish I did. Here is the last little um, tidbit that I'm going to leave you with. I'm not going to do it all, but I want to give you a feel for what I do and how, you know, if for some reason this like sticks out to you and you're kind of intrigued and you want more then I can definitely divulge in a, in a later conversation. But right now I just want you to pause for a second. You can even close your eyes or go off camera. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to cue your body muscles to completely relax. Um, it's one of the most refreshing things that I do for some of my classes that I, I lead. So if you can just sit up tall, align your posture, like what Heather was saying, all those good techniques of aligning the, the chin and the neck and that 90 degrees. And I want you to close your eyes and just take a few deep inhales and exhales. And it's like you're feeling your stomach inflate and deflate and your shoulders are soft and you feel the tension out of the forehead automatically release. It's like your jaw is unclenched. And I want you to lift your right leg up off your chair. And I want you to squeeze your muscles and take an inhale and tighten. So you take a deep breath in, exhale, release the leg down, and it just melts into the floor. You kind of feel like the swaying side to side might ease the muscles. Your toes kind of get really nice, comfortable. Take another deep breath in, lift your left leg up and tense those muscles inside of your legs, curl your toes under, hold your breath, exhale, release the leg, and maybe let it sway or let it soften, melting down. I'm gonna do the same thing with your arm. So I'm gonna have you take your arm up and squeeze your fist super hard, take a breath and hold it. And as you exhale, you release and the, the tensions released out of your fingertips. We'll do it the same on the other side. Take a deep breath in, bring the arm up, squeeze with all your might. And on your exhale, release and let your arm draw down. 
The last one I'll do is for your shoulders. Take a deep breath in and pull your shoulders up into the ears. Tighten every muscle, even in your face. Hold the breath. Exhale with pierced lips and relax the shoulders down away from the ears. Maybe take a second here to just move the head side to side or down and up or right to left, lots of different options. And then gently start to open your eyes, kind of wiggle your toes, bring yourself back. And I hope that leaves you feeling less tense than when you started the session. Maybe you feel a little bit more at ease, maybe a little bit more calm, but this just goes to show you those relaxation techniques really do work if you just take the time for yourself because you definitely deserve it. So with that, we would open ourselves up for questions. I'll stop sharing. You can let a rip on either Heather and I, ask us anything you want. And so I'll, I'll ask one on behalf of my staff up front. Sure. A lot of the circulation desks are, they're not desks. They're just a cabinet or a counter mm -hmm. and they're difficult to adjust for folks other than footstools and better chairs. Are there? So you um, if you need to adjust the height of your desk, they actually make like desk risers. I'm sure you've seen those uh, bed risers, the black hard plastic um, contraptions you can put under each leg of your desk. So um, if you need to raise your desk, um, that's a way that you can do that. Um, it's always easier to raise something than to lower it because you can add things, you know, to, to increase the height but it's um, hard to take away. So, and I realize that there's not going to be a solution for every single workspace. I mean, the stuff that I talked to you about is in an ideal situation, but hopefully between the adjustable chair and the ability to, um, you know, raise your desk. I mean, there, at least there, hopefully there'll be a couple of things that you can do to improve your, your workstation. Um, I missed the first few words of your question, but I'm, you know, like, obviously if your desk is a very attached to the wall or a super huge, heavy piece of furniture, it's going to be hard to do anything with that. But, um, but I mean, you know, hopefully you can take away a couple of the um, tips that I provided and just make it the best possible set up for you. Could you comment on um, some of the desks and things that people are preferring to stand instead of sit? They sure. Have those risers? Yeah, that, that's a really popular thing right now. Um, our CEO and his administrative assistant actually have standing desks and um, they, I mean, that's great. I think there are studies out there that show that people are more productive with standing desks because you just naturally are going to be more alert when you, <laughs> you have to concentrate a little bit more to stand up. You know, you don't get the head nod, nodding and stuff in the middle of the afternoon. But um, the only tip I have on that is like when we're talking about um, like work surface height is that when you're standing and have your fingers out, you I mean, you still want your arms to be your elbows to be at that 90 degree angle and your, your palms facing down, your keyboard should be about one inch below your forearm. So your arms are actually going to be, you know, down just a little bit. Does that make sense from like your standing posture? Um, but yeah, I, that's an amazing setup. Unfortunately, um, they're really expensive and, um, you know, I know that that's always an issue too. It's hard to like for us, if we work at the hospital, I mean, they're not going to buy standing desks for all of us. So, um, but I know that the people who do use them really like them. 
and they're usually adjustable too. Mm -hmm. You know, you can make them different heights. I think with like Barb, our Mm -hmm. Dennis's assistant, like you can even bring it all the way down to like, she can sit down if she wants to also. Maybe the price will come down. Yeah. Uh What are your recommendations for adjusting a desk or a chair for good posture when different? equipment isn't in the budget. (laughs) Oh, that's actually okay. So in the chat, we had a question. What are your recommendations for adjusting desk chair for good posture when better or different equipment isn't in the budget? And in parentheses, understanding that we probably should invest in this though. Um, Well, you know, that's the million dollar question. (laughs) (laughs) So um, I'm hoping, you know, just, uh, I mean, be creative. There's not like, you don't have to go out and buy, you don't have to go to the, you know, biggest, best desk ergonomic website and buy their ergonomic step stool for your foot. You can use a ream of paper, you know, so you just have to be creative. Once you discover what your needs are, then be creative. You know, like you don't need a pretty, um, stand to set your monitor on, get a couple of books that you're not using anymore and, and stick it on there. Um, the, the biggest challenge that I, I guess that I would think that you would come across if you don't have the adjustable chair or the ability to adjust your desk at all is just the height of, I mean, where your workplace is compared to where your body is. So, I mean, as far, if you don't have an adjustable chair, you know, they make all kinds of, um, if you need to be higher, they make all kinds of cushions. Uh, Like I have purchased like memory foam cushions at Ross or TJ Maxx to, to sit on, to adjust chair heights. I mean, you can even fold up a firm, you know, a blanket or something to sit on. Um, but Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't think I have like the perfect answer for that question. It's just a matter of you identifying what your needs are and then thinking outside the box to, to try to accomplish those. 